All right, so for day two of our Android Apps Part 1 class, I want to remind you um, about the, the project that we're working toward. So if, especially if you weren't here last time, take a quick look at this to remind you. This is our end result. If you go to uh, vmcampus.com slash sdce, that web project is what we are going toward together to create by the end of this month, part one, vmcampus.com slash sdce. It works best if you visit it on a mobile device, but if you don't and you go to it on your desktop browser at the bottom, click mobile site, and then you can rearrange your window like a tall and thin mobile device. This is the project that we're going toward by the end of the course. The address much more directly is up there. But this is what we're going toward. A multi-screen layout project that will have a home screen. This is the unofficial uh, app for this college. Uh, let's say someone wants to enroll in classes. They want to know about the college, what's available, schedules, and all of that. Um, so we're sort of creating an unofficial app. Uh, people would be able to look at art classes, computer classes, um, you know, all of this with animation and design and buttons and icons is all that we're going to go toward by the end of the course. Uh, you know, side panel, look at that, how it slides across. Again, if you're doing this on a mobile device, it's even more like an actual kind of app interface. <coughs> we're going to look at some, uh, some cool things like customization. A person will be able to um, type their name into the app and then that'll be used throughout the app. Now it says, Welcome Victor. Welcome, uh, become an artist, Victor. Learn about computers, Victor. So that's some customization. We'll see that trick there. We'll see about also a map. Having our app uh, recognize our location and then get directions and it'll give you turn-by-turn -turn navigation over to wherever you choose. So based on the technologies of HTML, CSS and JavaScript. This is what we're going toward by the end of the course. That was a whole two days ago. So remind me, what's the software we're using in order to write our code for this project? Notepad++. Uh, plain old notepad won't quite cut it. We want notepad++. So go ahead and then on your computer, click on the start menu, and then search here. Search for notepad++. How many of you are working on a Mac at home? Okay. Uh, I mentioned last time some alternatives to notepad++. If you're on the Mac, I mentioned brackets, sublime. What else is there? Brackets, sublime. What's that? Aptana. Eclipse. There's lots of co uh, software out there for you to write your code on a Mac. Um, but here uh, on our labs, we've got Windows computers. In this room, we've got Windows. We'll be using Notepad++, free download. Did anyone at least, when you went home, if you didn't have it, did you download Notepad++ at home? No one? Some people? Okay, 10 points for you. Ten, minus 10 for everyone else. Remember, try this at home. Use it or lose it. So we've got our Notepad++ file, uh, or our software. Let's go up to the File menu. We're going to start from scratch one more time. So whatever we did last time, I know mine was a big old weird mess. Um, I don't know about yours, but we're going to start over one more time. Uh, that'll give us some practice to create the basic foundation of a project, and then we'll get right away into some more coding of CSS and JavaScript. So let's go up to File, New. get a brand new document. Let's go to File, Save As. File menu, Save As. If you've got a, a flash drive, you want to plug that in to save your work. If you didn't, you can save it to the desktop. But if you don't take your work with you, it's going to go away. These computers have a software called Deep Freeze, which is that when uh, you restart the computer, everything erases. So if you left it on the desktop expecting it to be here next time, it's not. Our software deep freeze cleans out the computer every time someone restarts it. That's for security purposes. 
So I'm saving uh, this file to my flash drive with today's date. And remember to change the save as type to hypertext markup language, HTML. HTML is the language that we're using here, of course. It's the foundation of our app. It's, uh, it's code that is rather universal. It's been around since 1989. It's been evolving. It's behind a lot of our, our modern and powerful and cool websites, YouTube, Facebook, all of that. And it's going to, what, and it's going to be what powers our, our, our apps. Let's save that. We have a blank document, which is, of course, the best and worst thing for any programmer. It's the best because we have a brand new white canvas to make the best great app, the greatest app ever. It's the worst thing because we've got a whole thing to work with that is uh, um, could go anywhere. So what we need to do for the practice, remember last time, we have to define what kind of document this is, what kind of project. So we will type the the tag of the doc type. So this defines what it is. It's HTML5. Doc type HTML5. Last time we also wrote that then what follows is our HTML code. And remember we've got the HTML pairs. The HTML tag pairs. Within the HTML block, we had the head block, opening and closing head tags, and we also had the body block. So we did that last time. Let's go ahead and type this like we did previously. It was the first thing we did last time, and we're not going to do this over and over. We're not going to start from scratch over and over, maybe the first two or three times but then we'll be quickly getting up and running with frameworks and shortcuts and such. So here we're defining a document of HTML5 with a head and body section. Back to the head section, remember we created a title block and we can do it like this. And this will be Android 1 Day 2. Our workflow was that we write some code, we save our work, and then we view our work, or we run our work. So we wrote our code here. Let's save our file. You can click the little Save icon up here, or File, Save. And then we go up to the Run menu. I'm going to be running Firefox. I'm simply going to select it because it's the very first thing on the list, just to quickly get to it. Also, the, the keyboard shortcut Control Alt Shift X. You can actually hit it with one hand with a little practice. And so I've just gotten into the habit of running it, but I jump between all the browsers. It's a good idea to test on different browsers, and we've got them all installed here. But I'm going to see my results over in Firefox. Remember to save your work. And at this point, we don't have that anything that impressive yet. So save it and run it. We don't have anything that impressive, but we have a functional HTML document. We'll see in the web browser, we see the title up there, nothing in the body yet. <coughs> nothing in the body. Question? Yes, is there an uh, item in Notepad plus uh, a line you tag? Um, possibly, but let me show you this trick here. Let's say I have everything aligned to the left. What you can do is you can select the blocks that you want to align and then press tab and they all align together. So there, there's probably some feature somewhere there that lets you auto-align. <coughs> but if you had everything you know, lined up to the left, you can select 
like that. If I had everything to the left, I can make a multiple selection, hit tab, and all of those indent together. So the thing about the indenting, as I said previously, that's optional, but it's very good for readability. So the title child element is inside the head parent element, which is inside the HTML parent element, which would mean actually that the head element is a child of the HTML element, something inside of something, child and parent relationships. The whole thing is HTML, so that's ultimately the big parent element in our case, body block, blood, body element is a child, head is a child, and head itself has a child, a sub-child, title. We need one more thing here actually to make it um, uh, um, the most compatible and modern version of our basic file. Let's back up to the, the head block and give yourself a new line 4 before title. We're going to write a new tag we haven't seen yet. This is known as a meta tag. So we're going to write the meta tag, M-E-T-A. That one does not have a pair. Like 99% of tags, like I said previously, have a pair. I'll mention the ones that don't. Doc type doesn't. We saw that previously. Here's a new one, meta. It doesn't have a pair. What was another tag that we used previously that didn't have a pair? Image. But image didn't have it didn't have a pair, but it did have what? Attributes. We had extra sort of parameters, attributes to further define what the image tag does. So we need attributes for this meta tag. I'll explain what it is, what it means in a moment, but let's write this. So go back into your meta tag and add a space in the tag. We're gonna add an attribute. This is the attribute of C H A R S E T. If you've never had experience in HTML, answer this question. How would you pronounce that word I just typed? I'm curious. Some people would say char set, some people would say car set. If you have had experience in HTML, how do you pronounce it? Care set. Care set. Okay, that's a good one too. So the point is that it really has no universal pronunciation. I think I call it car set, sometimes char set, but it's short for character set, so maybe care set is a good one. It's character set. And I'm saying, what set of characters is this document using? Car set equals, quote, end quote, UTF-8. Websites, web projects can be in multiple languages. Right now, we're writing it in English, basically. But we can write a website, a web project, in Spanish in um, Cyrillic, in Hebrew, in Japanese, in, um, in Arabic, etc. We can write a website in multiple languages. And so in order for us to be most compatible and to be understood by the most web browsers and, and viewers, right here we're defining what's the character set, what's the, what's the range of alphabets that we can display. UTF-8 is one of the ones that's got like, I don't know, 32,000 letters that can be displayed. So all the letters of English and Spanish and Cyrillic and uh, Hebrew, etc. UTF-8. That's a good uh, idea there, perhaps, to write a note. How do we write notes or comments in our code? I'm going to give myself a new line above number four, and then I'll write the comment tag. It should turn green, and it should stop, right? Starting comment tag, ending comment tag is one of the weirdest ones. There's no other tag, really, that looks like that. But it does have a pair. It's also unique because it doesn't have the slash like every other tag. <clears throat> it doesn't look like an exact mirror image like the other tags. But the point of that is maybe make a comment here to explain myself. This meta tag defines the character set as 
as UTF-8. I don't remember what UTF stands for, but basically it's the uh, definition of uh, these various alphabets that we can use in our project. This is a more complete HTML document. Last time we didn't write the meta tag, but it still worked. And that goes to show that HTML, on the one hand, can be very forgiving, and on the other hand, it can be very strict. Technically, the web browser is the one that can be forgiving or strict, because we're writing the code, and the web browser, like Firefox or Internet Explorer or whatever, it then interprets it. And throughout the history of the web, every browser, unfortunately, has translated or determined what this code means slightly differently. That's the annoying thing about being a, a web designer. Um, us web designers have a little jealousy to graphic designers. Does anyone know the difference between a web designer and a graphic designer? A web designer is someone that works in web projects, writing code, making websites, and so forth. A graphic designer is someone that oftentimes work, works with printed materials. So a graphic designer most likely designed this book, which is falling apart. They design the margins and all of that. And oftentimes us web designers have a jealousy with graphic designers because they know exactly the size of this page. It's exactly eight and a half. Therefore, I can put a margin exactly one inch. And it'll always be one inch because the book is exact. It's a physical thing. Web designers, we have to design a project that looks good on Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera, and on mobile devices. Android phones, iPhone phones, iPads, Windows phones, Blackberries, and everyone's got their own version. Even if you stick with just, let's say, an iPhone, you had an iPhone 4, then an iPhone 5, iPhone 6, you remember how it has changed the screen, for example. Maybe you had a Galaxy, Samsung Galaxy uh, S4, and then the S5, and then the S6, and you remember how that changes. So we're building something that is not tangible, and then has to be viewed and used in a variety of devices. So, we have challenges. In this document here, what we will next do is we're going to, at the end of the day, what we're going to do is create a fun little proof of concept JavaScript app that lets us collect names and display them alphabetically or randomly and so forth that will require JavaScript. Let me bring my notes up again here. I'll write some basic notes. HTML, we're going to work with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I said previously uh, that our HTML is the structure of the project. CSS is the design of the project. And the JavaScript is the interaction. Sometimes you hear these uh, with the term of the, of the content layer. So we'll say AKA content layer. People want to get fancy, so they make fancy words. Um, the design could also be aka the presentation layer. And JavaScript, uh, that, one can, that one can be the behavior layer. Different names for the same kind of idea. We write the HTML to create our structure. This is where we add our content. Right, our text, our pictures, etc. The CSS is the design. I want a rounded picture. I want a drop sh a picture with a drop shadow. Presentation. How does it look? JavaScript. Well, I want it to do something. Right now, our project works. It doesn't look that nice. We haven't done any CSS. But it doesn't do anything. It just displays, but it is not interactive. I can't click on anything to do anything. That will be JavaScript interaction or behavior layer. So our, our end result today is we're going to explore more of the, these different layers, these different aspects of the app. So this is going to be eventually a project that collects your um, a list of names. You're going to type names, it'll store it, and then it'll display those names, let's say randomly. Um, 
that'll be via JavaScript. In the body section, we're going to write the heading one tag, h1. Remember last time I wrote it on one line. Here I'm breaking it up just for fun to do it differently. It doesn't matter if we put these lines on these tags on one line or not. This will be our random name picker. This project will allow us to pick names randomly that we give it. The way we're going to do this is we're going to have some boxes here. We're going to have a box for a person to type a name and click Save. Save the name. Store the name. So this is going to require a new tag we haven't seen yet. The form tag. It's like a form that you see on a variety of websites where you have to fill something in. You're going to register to create an account on some website. <coughs> and there will be boxes for you to fill in and check boxes to check. And buttons to click. That means we're creating a form for them to fill out. And a form can be complex or simple. You often see a form like this. Let me show you one of the most common forms you see all the time, perhaps. This is a form. When you do a search on Google or Yahoo or Bing or whatever, that's, that's a form, usually. There's a box, type something, click a button to do something. That's a form. Maybe if you do something like uh, come here often, this is a form. Put your name and your password and then log in. That's a form. We're going to need something like that as well. Input boxes and buttons to do something with it. So within the form. I'm going to tab in here because these elements are children elements of the parent form element which is a ch child itself of the body element, which is a, a child itself of the HTML parent element. So we'll type the input tag. This one does not have a pair, but it has a bunch of attributes. First of all, type. What type of input do we have here? We can go look it up on a, on a book or a website, a list of all of the possible forms. For, uh, input box, check box, blah blah blah. So we have to say what kind of type of input this is. This is a this is a text input. I will be collecting text here. I can't wait to see this. So let's save it and run it. See what does it look like. Let's check this out. Save it and run it. Ooh, that's looking cool. And look at that. If you click there, you can type into it. We're still miles away from doing anything useful, but with simply the input uh, input tag, there's an input box where I can type. Let's refine it some more. Let's put some text on screen to show what this is about. Question? Uh, quick question?
really like to use comments and so So this input box um, needs a bunch of parameters uh, for it to fully function. Um, we're going to say, how about a little bit of placeholder text to show people what are you supposed to type here? So we've got an attribute called placeholder equals. <coughs> this will put some placeholder text in the box to guide people what to type. So we'll say name. And I can type here in capital letters. I can type it something like your name. I can type, um, you know, first name, last name, whatever you want. And notice I'm typing it with capital letters and spaces and commas, like human readable, human readable uh, text. Everything else, as we talked last time, lowercase. Everything is lowercase. Placeholder text. If you save it and run it. That should appear inside the box. I think it's a little too much text. <coughs> but the point is you can put whatever you want in place. Or I'll just put name. Now, placeholder the placeholder attribute actually is um, a more modern bit of HTML. It's HTML5. So not every web browser might understand that. And if it doesn't understand it, it'll just ignore it. And someone will get an empty box that they don't know what it is. So as a fallback for the people that might not have that functionality, Let's back up and let's do this. Before this input, we're going to write um, the label tag, and that one does have a pair. Label slash label. In between the two label tags, I'm going to write name. That's what's going to appear on screen. Label tag is an old HTML tag that is recognized by everything. And so if the web browser or the device doesn't understand placeholder, it will understand label. But we need to specify this text, this label is used for, is connected to input. So label needs an attribute which is simply for, F-O-R. So think about it as meaning this label is for that input box. Uh, we'll call this input name. We're saying something on screen is called input name. This label is being used for the thing on screen called input name. This one, so far, however, doesn't know that this is attached to it. So this is going to be another attribute that says name equals input name. That's how this label will know to work with this input box and vice versa. So to the input box, let's add the attribute name. So I'm just building more attributes on it. Input attribute type, attribute placeholder, attribute name equals in the exact name that I typed in the for attribute, which uh, what did I call it input name. This one, in my in our case, we made it up. All of everything else that we've been doing is defined in the in the HTML standard. But there's going to be places where we make something up where we write something uh, however we want because we're programming it and we're deciding the, the structure and such. So here we've given a name to this box so that we can work with it. 
we made up the name, input name. We could have called it anything else. We could have called it my name. We could have called it username. So if we call this input, you don't have to do this, but if we called it username, I would call the other one up here username. Okay, don't change it, but that's, that's why they're both using the same name. Now, didn't I say that everything is lowercase? Yes, except if you don't want it to be. Uh -huh. Like here. Because this could have been just fine. Input, lowercase name. But oftentimes, <coughs> the, uh, the style of when we write code, especially when it's more than one word, we do intercaps, which is capital letters inside of the word, because input name and input name would work just fine. But which is more readable? Input name or input name? Input name. The one with the capital N. So that is allowed. In some instances, I'll point them out, of course. There's nothing to fully capitalize here and, and here. It's, this is really done when it's like two or three words strung together, because we can't use spaces. We shouldn't use dashes or underscores. We need to run the word together. That's it's part of the specification. And uh, at least what we can do is intercaps, capital letters inside of the words. Let's save it and run it. And what should happen is that on screen, it still has the input box, but it's got the text name. Those that can't see name placeholder will still see it name here. And anyway, let's say I have a modern browser that this works just fine. You say, well, that looks redundant. It looks redundant. When you click in the box and start typing, it goes away. So you forget, what was I supposed to type here again? Oh, the name. Only first name? Well, whatever I call that label will then display it over there. Oops. So we're, we're simply, we're going to be pretty basic here. We're going to ask for the person to put in a name and then a button that says something like, oh, sorry, we're totally full. You can try it again next time. Can I go with you? We're totally full. Can I go You can wait outside. Okay, of course. So right here, we're, we've got a, a box, but we then need some sort of button, perhaps, to make the action happen, to do something about it. So I want to add a, a button, like a go button or a save button or something. Um, on the neck, uh, this is I'm on line 15. On the next line 16, let's add another input tag. Input can be used for a variety of ways. Input. So therefore, we need to define a type. What type of input element is this? And we have an input type of button. This creates a button on screen. We need that button to say something. It doesn't know what it should say. So the next attribute is value. We'll say save. The button will say save. Go ahead and save and run that and see what it looks like. So there's the name label, there's the input box, there's my save button. Wait a minute, didn't I press enter and move it below? I'll address that in a moment. I click save, nothing happens. We haven't programmed it to do anything. We're not there yet. But getting back to the issue, I thought I pressed enter to move save below the box. HTML ignores that, just like HTML ignores the tabs and the spaces. I can do this, tab, 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 and that'll still work the same. I can do this, label, space, 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 four. It'll ignore that. And I can press enter, 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 and it'll ignore all of that. I have to specify exactly what I mean, and therefore, 
I need to move this input to to its own line. It thinks it, it it thinks I want it all on the same line. If I were typing this in a text document, I would press enter to break the line and give me a new line. I have a tag for that. I have a tag to break this line into the next line. So before the input, and again it won't it won't matter where we put it, but I want this before input, I'll type the br tag. Break does not have a pair. What this will do is now the button should break to the next line. The functionality would still be the same, but visually, structure-wise, it's what I want here, simply br <coughs> break. There we go. It's on the next line. Yes, we'll deal with the alignment. It's too close to the top line and all of that stuff. We'll deal with that later. That's CSS. The structure is HTML. The design is CSS. We'll get to that. Yes? What's the difference when using BR versus P? BR and P, the difference is that they have an inherent meaning and usage and style. If we were instead to put a P tag here, so oftentimes a way to answer this is we can try it. Uh, but if we do put a p tag here, we have to do its pair. And do you see a difference? Break tag, p tag. Any difference? It has an inherent amount of space. Break tag has no extra space. P tag has some space. It has other elements and other deeper things like is it block level or inline level, you know, other things to talk about. But there's a tag that does a specific thing, it has specific defaults, and so forth. So we could have put a p tag in there. I, I don't quite want it at the moment. That's a good that's a good point. We learned the p tag previously. We could have used it for the moment. Just for something else, we use the break tag. Oftentimes, when you are filling out some sort of form, let's say one with like. 10 things to fill in. You're filling it in, and at a certain point, whoops, I made a mistake. Let me start over. Have you seen that? That you can reset a form and start over? We can do that. Let's say, actually, I don't want to type this name. Cancel. I want to, I want to start over. I want to type a different name. So we can add another kind of button to cancel our form input. I want to keep that one on the same line, perhaps, as my save button. So. On my line 16, I'll add a space. I'll put in another input. Now, when I teach coding, I usually do it the long way, and then you can decide for shortcuts. And by that, I mean whenever there is a tag that has a pair, I write the starting tag and the ending tag right away. I could have started to teach us. Let's write form, then label, then break, then form. The problem with that, I feel, especially for beginners, is we can often forget to close our tag. I'm writing so much code that I forgot to close the form tag. I went on to other stuff. And it may or may not work. It's better to be safe than sorry. So when I teach this stuff, I always write right away the pairs of things. Remember here, for, I said for equals quote end quote. I wrote the pairs of quotes. If I forget to close that quote, the whole thing will most likely break. See, everything looks purple. It's supposed to look purple and blue and black and red. If I didn't close that quote, everything looks the wrong color. So whenever I teach things, I teach to write the pair. Later on, you can decide, I know what I'm doing, I'll write the whole thing. But don't come crying to me when it didn't work. So what I'm getting at here is we have an input tag and I'm going to complete it and then write the details. Input, opening and closing, pair. Type equals quote and quote. Type equals quote and quote. So that I don't forget to, to close that pair. And this time we have the uh, type of reset. We have a special button that is already defined as the reset button, as the clear this form button. 
and we could put in our own value. I think it automatically gives it a name, but it's better to be specific, so we will give a name. We will write some text in the button via value property. And uh, let's write cancel. The button will say cancel. should say cancel. Let's save it and run it. So I type a name here, I click Save. It doesn't really save yet, we haven't programmed that. But it does work. If you click Cancel, it does cancel. It does clear it. That's built in. Save doesn't know what we mean with that. It doesn't really do anything. Let's pause here. Does everyone have something like this? Does anyone need any help? Okay, so we'll get to the uh, let's do let's do one thing here and then we'll, we'll do a little CSS before we forget this. Eventually, um, the way this will work is that there's an input box. Someone will type something and click save. That save button will then set off a chain of events, a chain of code which will then check what's in the box and then it'll take what's in the box and do something with it whatever we typed here then something will happen when we click save it'll take the name out of, out of the box to do something with it in order for that to work well that button basically needs to know check what's in that box that input the way to do that and we'll see that as we write code especially JavaScript there's so many ways to do the same thing and they're all right and they're all wrong. It just depends on what you need to do. If that code works well for you, then it works. Why learn another way, perhaps? Well, yes, maybe there's a more efficient way to do it. There's another way to do it. That's valid. But if your code does what you need it to do, it's the right code. And so what I needed to do eventually is click the Save button, take what's, what's in the text box, and do something with it. One of the ways to do it is to refer to that box with a unique identifier. We can have multiple boxes on that screen. So how does that save button know to take the name from that box instead of the second box with the unique identifier? We'll add one more attribute to our input. So at the end, after the name attribute, we will add the ID attribute. Simply ID. Um, because this uh, because this input uh, because this reset button is in is a child element of that particular form it knows but we can also specify if we have multiple forms how we're doing it here we could add form ID equals form one and then further write some code for that reset box to target only this form but because it's a child element of this parent form element works. And so we need a unique name for this. This is one where we can make it up. This can be anything we want. Um, we're going to call this BTN save. This can be anything you want. And when people learn how to code, oftentimes people, people pick up these styles of coding depending on whoever teaches them. So it's like the self-perpetuating styles of, of how to code. Because perhaps you take another class, in that other class, they're going to be telling you everywhere where, you, where we're using double quotes, they're using single quotes. Both of those work, single quotes or double quotes. But the whole time so far, we've been using double quotes. So it doesn't matter which you do, which you learn, as long as you stay consistent with it. Question? It is this this input. It's not using. Yes, this is any name that we want it to be, and we are saying that it's an input type of text. It's collecting text, and this can be anything we want. So we're saying. Oh wait, 
Wait, what am I saying? Um, that would make sense, yes. Um, this will work because we are inventing this, but logically, I do see what you're saying. Um, sorry, yes, I meant input input name. We will use the same ID. Both ways would work, but logically this would be a better way. Yes, thanks for catching that. Because this is an input box and this input box is going to save a name. We could have an input box for a password and that would be input password. What I meant was, I'm thinking a little bit of a, a head, this button over here would be our BTN save. So I can use the same name here twice. But what the button will do is reference that uh, that that box in a moment. Yes. What's the difference between ID and name? We used name because that relates to label. We're saying this text that appears on screen is a label used for the element called input name. So that's how this label knows to be associated with this input text, input box. Uh, so this name of this input box is the same as this label that's being used for. That's how we link the two. And then we've got ID, which we will use in a moment to capture that name with the input of the button save. So for the moment, this is what we've got so far, just to check if our code is working. We've got this text. Save still doesn't work. Cancel works fine. This is going to be useful for us a little bit later. We're going to sort of put a dot, dot, dot on that. We'll get back to that in a moment. But as I'm, as I'm getting to this, the button when we click Save will take the name written on this input field. And it knows because we're going to reference that input field with that ID in a little bit. Right now our, our design looks like this, which is not that interesting. It's a plain, basic black and white. Uh, we wrote a little HTML. Let's write a little CSS to maybe change the design a little bit. Then we'll write some JavaScript for it to actually do something. Previously, we wrote CSS in an inline manner. I didn't call it that, but let's make a note here. CSS can be written as either inline, embedded, or external. Inline is written right on the element, right on the tag. That's what we did last time. As I said, it wasn't the best way, but it was a quick way to, to learn that, especially if you've never used CSS before. We wrote style equals etc. We wrote some inline CSS directly on the, uh, the tag. In a moment, we're going to engage in a little bit of embedded CSS, which is uh, written in a central location in the document. <coughs> what that means is all of the CSS code, instead of it being, being written here and here and here, it will all be in one central location. We'll talk about pros and cons and why of all of these in a moment. An external written in a file, in a separate file, spell check, who cares, written in a separate file central location. So inline CSS, one pro, one good thing about it is, works quickly. 
I can write some CSS directly on this h1 tag, and it's done, and it works. A con, a negative of that, can lose track of your code. Another con is not central. Another con is hard to maintain. I could go on. There's more negatives than positives about writing your code in line. We did it very quickly and easily last time, and it worked. We didn't have a complex project. As we get more complex, we want to avoid inline CSS as much as possible. Because we're going to have a, 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 an app, a project that's 500 lines, 1,000 lines. And to kind of scroll through it and find the right code when it's in line like this can be difficult. And even with good old control F to find within our document, that could also be tricky if our CSS code, <coughs> code is strewn throughout the 1,000 lines of code. So embedded. The pro about that, easier to maintain. All of the relevant CSS code is in one section at the very top of our document. Quickly to find, quickly to edit, quickly to change. A con of that only works with current documents. I have at the moment, one document, the document with today's date. But eventually, we're going to have a project that has a home screen, a, uh, an art classes screen, a um, PC classes screen. All of those three screens could be separate files. One file called home.html, another one called art.html, and another one called pchtml. I might want to do that for several reasons, but let's say I have that. So if I write embedded HTML in my home HTML file, I mean embedded CSS in my home HTML file, it only applies to the home HTML file. Therefore, the, back, the cool background color and all of that that I set on the home HTML file doesn't automatically apply to the art HTML file or the PC HTML file. It's been embedded into only one document. That could be a big con, especially if I've got a lot of documents. So guess what? That's where external comes in. Con, uh, pro, can be applied to multiple documents. That could be a big pro. I write all of my CSS code in one separate file. For example, colors.css. And I write 100 lines of CSS in that one file. I then link that file to the home HTML file, the uh, art HTML file, and the computer's HTML file. And when I make a change to that CSS file, all of those changes trickle down to all of the linked files. So it can be applied to multiple documents, easier to maintain, and edit. So it's all the positives of what the others were negative. And a con of that must be written correctly. Doing it in an external way requires that we write our code in a specific way and also link those files correctly. Writing specific code that links the HTML, CSS file, the HTML file, and the CSS file. And if we don't type that correctly, then the HTML file doesn't know to use that CSS file and then it won't work. And the preferred way to do this is external. I mean, that doesn't mean you cannot do these other ways. But as much as possible, we should put our HTML file, HTML code in one file, our CSS code in another file, and when we get to JavaScript, JavaScript can be inline, embedded, and external. And same pros and cons with JavaScript. When we get to JavaScript, we should also put our code externally so that we have like one file that has all of our library of code that we can reuse over and over. We're going to write some CSS, but we're not going to do it external just yet. We're going to do it embedded. We're going to have one central location for our CSS code to maintain it easier to get practice with that, because that is useful. 
and then a little later, then we'll do external. We can move it out of the, the file, but we'll start with just one file for the moment to keep it easier. Back to our code. In the head section, we wrote the meta tag, the title tag, and now we will write the style tag. So make sure you're in the head section. Mine is line 9, whatever yours might be, but in the head section. Remember, you can click on a tag and Notepad++ should find its pair. If it doesn't, you might have written the pair wrong. Or if it doesn't have a pair, it doesn't highlight a pair. But make sure you've written the style tag pair in the head section head block. And this basically means we're about to write CSS. Now in the old days, we would need to write an attribute here. Don't do this. Style, I don't even remember it. Style uh, type equals uh, CSS slash text, I think. Don't even worry about it. Um, text CSS or something. Um, don't worry about the attribute. We are using HTML5. And HTML5 <coughs> assumes that wherever there's a style tag, it means CSS. If this project were going to be opened up in an old web browser, Internet Explorer 7, Firefox 6, Chrome 2.0 or something, it might be a concern. But again, we are forward thinking in this class. We're not going to dwell and deal with the really old browsers anyway. We're going toward a device. There's no such thing as Firefox 3.0 on an Android phone. There's no such thing as Internet Explorer 7 on a phone. So we'll be fine with simply creating a style block like this. We will write body, space, curly bracket, space, close curly bracket. You may never have seen these before. These curly brackets are next to the P on your keyboard. Next to the P, you've got left square bracket and right square bracket. If you then want the curly brackets, shift left square bracket and shift right square bracket gives you left curly bracket, right curly bracket. Sometimes they call them braces. Those people are wrong. They're brackets. Just kidding. Everyone calls them what they want. But square bracket, square brace, curly bracket, uh, curly brace. I usually call them brackets. Open curly bracket, space, close curly bracket. Again, there's a pair here. So I write both of them so that I don't forget to close it. If I never close that, the whole project may break. Inside of that, let's write body dash color colon pick a color semicolon. That looks familiar. We wrote I'm sorry body background color dash color. We're that's familiar. We wrote background dash color previously. We wrote it directly on the body tag previously, didn't we? Style equals body uh, background color pink. Here we're writing it in a slightly different way. We have created or we have chosen a selector with properties and values. Previously, right on the body, that's what we're selecting. We wrote the attribute style with the uh, property background color and the value yellow. Here, the selector is defined in style. Save it and run it. And what should happen is the web browser sees something down here is called body. Got selected, basically. Let's apply the property and the value, and it changes. That's embedded CSS. Can you figure out a way? How can I change the color of random name picker the way we just learned? 
how can we select that text from this CSS style block? Well, random name picker is being defined by the structural element h1. So what if I write h1 and the rest? h1 space curly brace space curly brace so that I don't forget it and I'll say change my text color color <coughs> colon uh, brown semicolon remember color is text color not text dash color it's color so my h1 is the selector there's something on screen called h1. The web browser started from the top and went to the bottom of my code. It got to line 11. Firefox, in my case, found line 11, saw that command, processed it, and attached it to or used it upon h1 down on line 15. And it should have made your heading 1 tag then color brown. There it is. Let's take our first break. We'll explore this much more, of course, in just a moment. This is what we've got so far. <clears throat> Still not fully functional yet, but we're playing with some HTML structure, some CSS design, and we'll get some JavaScript interaction. So it's 7.20. Let's take a break until 7.30.